protected species division, um, Mahalani said, and I think some of you have heard from other members of our division recently about turtles. Maybe it was a couple months ago. Um, we cover cetaceans, turtles, and monk seals in our division, but a long, long time ago in a galaxy not that far away over in Maui, I was a uh, behavioral ecologist for studying humpback whales and spent five years in Maui and then also studied them in Alaska and Australia. And so that plus updated research is what I'll present to you today. Um, but I, am, I like animal behavior, so if you have any animal behavior questions, do stop and ask me as we go through. I mentioned before that I also like a conversational structure to our talk, so if you have questions as we go, feel free to raise your hand and we can address it then or if I'll let you know if we're covering it later. So the talk, or the title of the talk I have today is Big Winged Migrators, Humpback Whales, Megaptera, Novangelae in the North Pacific. So big wings comes from the Latin name for humpback whale. Megaptera is big winged and Novangelae is New Englander. So they're typically called the big winged New Englanders and so they also are the big winged migrators. Wait, how do I use this? All right. My alternative cheesy title is Migration Mysteries. So we're going to cover many of the mysteries about migration, the ones that have been solved, and some that are not. So the journey for our talk, we'll cover a bit of the basics for humpback whales. And then first mystery is why they migrate. Second is how, or 1.5, how they migrate. Um, mystery number two, does location matter? Why Hawaii? Is Hawaii good? What about Hawaii is good? Mystery number three, uh, where have some of the whales gone? We'll get to that. Number four, what can song tell us? Some exception to the quote unquote rules. And number five is will climate affect migration? So a bit of the basics. So humpback whales feed in the high latitude cold water areas in the summer. For us, that's typically up in Alaska. Then they migrate down to the lower latitude warmer waters for mating and calving. That's when they're down here. Humpback whales are in all of the world's oceans, so there's two major kind of population divisions through the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. There's not much overlap, and you'll actually, there's a genetic difference between those two populations. If you ever see pictures of humpback whales that are all white, they have a really white belly and their, their um, pec fins are all white, those are usually southern hemisphere humpback whales. And the whales that we have up here are a little bit darker. And so, the, but there, you look at those areas in yellow, there's not that much difference between their distance between them compared to where they're migrating. So that's, I can use that the clicker, yeah. So if this is Hawaii, so that distance isn't that great compared to, or the distance is just as great as maybe down here. But because of the seasonal offset, when it's our winter and our whales are here, it's the summer in the Southern Hemisphere and so the whales are there. So there's this shift all the time. So they actually never really cross cross paths. A little bit more about humpbacks. They are baleen whales. Um, they live at least 40 years. We're still waiting to find out how long because we haven't been studying them for that long. Males, when they're down here, they physically compete for access to females. So there's a lot of fighting. They get these big competitive groups. They're following one female around. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, the whales are feeding on schooling fish. And in the southern hemisphere, primarily they're feeding on krill. And their natural predators are killer whales, sometimes sharks and the human population. So focusing a little bit on Hawaii, for the wintering grounds, things to keep in mind as we go through the talk, so this is their calving grounds. The females come down here to mate, and they have about a gestation period of about 10 and a half months, so they'll mate somewhere through the winter season, head back up to Alaska, come back and give birth back here in Hawaii. Um, it's mating ground, there's all this competition happening, and I think some of you maybe have heard of humpback whale song, and so the males are the only ones that sing, and we'll cover a little bit more about song later in this presentation. They are not eating when they're down here. They're fasting the entire time. So the entire, however long they choose to be down here, they're losing weight, basically. And so they have an energy, a limited energy budget to work with. And there are no stable social relationships. So you'll see two whales, but it'll be a different two whales the next day. Up in the feeding grounds, there are uh, associations where you see the same two whales again together over and over and over again for years. Um, there is a group I work with up in Alaska that has two females. They call her the old ladies, and they just hang out all together. They always seem in the same bay. You'll never see females together here. You've never seen two adult females in the same group. So it's always males escorting the females. So how do we know this much about the whales? So it's mainly right now, or at least historically, the fluke photos. So the underside of the humpback whale tail is basically like a fingerprint. 
the black and white pattern is set from about a year of age and the trailing edge here is set from birth. So if you've got photos, you can track them over time and match them and then you can find things. Um, so this is the same whale. This one's only seen a day apart, but you can say from this scar here, is that scar there, that scar there is right there. And so we can track things like where, where they're showing up, trends in location, behavioral role, group size, migration time, et cetera. For example, here's a whale we call White Bar. She was seen, or he was seen, uh, in Maui in 1981, then back up feeding in Alaska in 81 and 82, and again in 85, seen back on Maui in 87, and then in 89 and 92, he was seen in Hawaii, or Big Island. These are the main breeding and feeding areas for our population of humpback whales in the North Pacific. That's the right button. So we're in Hawaii. Most of the whales that we have coming here are coming from Alaska, and we'll talk more about that a bit later. Um, there's also a big breeding population in Revilla Hejedo Islands off Mexico, Baja, mainland Mexico, and they're heading up usually primarily to uh, Washington, Oregon, California coast, British Columbia, and up into Alaska. And then we've got another uh, Western Pacific population that are off Japan and Okinawa and the Ogasawara Islands, the um, Philippines, and we'll talk more about those guys later, and they usually head up more towards Russia and the Aleutian Islands. So mystery number one, why migrate? You've got food, why leave? Anybody got an idea? It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the, and we don't, I mean, that's one of the reasons. And so we've got, basically you want to give birth and they want to have a, a safe area uh, for their calves. And if you're not going to be, well, we don't know what, how it evolved as far as fasting and whatnot, but you're not going to lose as much energy to the environment if you're in warmer waters. And so basically they're looking for protected areas for their calves to avoid these guys. And so... There was a study done uh, back, it was published in 2001, looking at photos of females with their calves in Maui or in Hawaii, and then up in Alaska, and they estimated a first year mortality of 15 to 24%. And so basically, I don't think many of the breeding areas, they're all protected. We don't have, we've seen killer whales a couple times down here, but they're basically not a strong presence. And so it's a safe area to have, have your calf. And where the females go, the males will follow. Mystery 1.5. How? Humpbacks don't have Google Maps. <laughs> They're crossing vast swaths of ocean that don't have any major landmarks that we know of. And so there's a big question, how are they doing this? Again, focusing on the population that we have here, the distance from Hawaii to the Gulf of Alaska, where most of the whales are migrating, is 4,200 kilometers. The fastest migration time documented, both by photo ID and tagging, was 39 days. So they're going 39 days through straight open ocean um, they've got average swim speed of about four and a half kilometers per hour. And then a study done back in 1998, or published in 98, looked at the migratory path. A researcher tagged several whales. Two of them started their migration, and they basically hit magnetic north on their way up. They just left, I can't remember if it was Maui or the Big Island, and they just went straight north. And so they're, fought, they're definitely keying in somehow to the magnetic field. We don't know how, but somehow. Another really cool study was done all over the South Pacific where they tagged a bunch of whales in Brazil and in Rarotonga, Cook Islands, and New Caledonia. And those whales also were following magnetic headings, but not necessarily straight south. So these guys from Brazil are heading down towards Antarctica. They're not following the exact same path, but you'll notice the lines are straight. And so they'll, follow, they'll go at least 200 kilometers at a shot and going like within one degree of a magnetic heading. And I've been in small boats tracking whales just even in the Ao channel, and I can just track, you know, find a compass heading, and the whale dives it's down for five, seven minutes. You just keep going on that magnetic heading, the whale comes right back up again. So they're following something. Um, South Pacific, this is interesting. So the South Pacific um, whales, the Rarotonga ones, they basically started going west and then south, and these guys were going a little bit east and then south, so they're all kind of heading in the same direction, but they're, they're keying into something else in the environment, and we don't know exactly what that is. So it's a combination of a magnetic heading plus something. So shifting gears a little bit and looking at once we're in Hawaii. So when all, you know, when the whales, do they all go as a huge group and migrate all at once? Or do they, they seem to trickle in? And so what's going on there? Is there some, you know, pattern? And there actually is a pattern as far as behavioral class. 
they call it the migratory parade and it's been they've known about it since the 60s the 50s even so the first ones to arrive on the wintering grounds are going to be your mothers who have yearlings so they've they've given birth the previous year brought the yearling up to the feeding grounds coming back down want to get rid of this calf and wean them and go on their merry way and so they're the first ones to get down here second ones are the amateur whales um, we still aren't sure why they migrate they're not mating they're not calving why bother but they come with the group um, mature males are coming down here they want to maximize they have some of the longest residency times of the behavioral classes because they want to maximize their mating opportunities so they want to be down here as long as they have energy reserves to keep them here Resting females, and those are females that don't have a calf right now and are not about to give birth. They're the next class to come down and they're gonna hang out and we'll talk about them in a second. Followed by the pregnant females, and so they're gonna delay, they're gonna eat as much as they possibly can and then make their migration back down right before they calf. Sometimes they give birth on the migration route, but most of the time it's here. So fast forward a couple months, once it's time to leave, excuse me, the first ones to leave are the newly pregnant females. So basically they go out the minute they get pregnant, they turn around and head north and you don't see them in the population anymore. There's no point in being here. They want to eat. They're like, got it done. I'm on my way. <laughs> so immature whales, next ones, they don't have the energy reserves to stay. They're too small. It takes a lot and there's no food here. So they're going to hang out for a while and they're like, I'm hungry, I'm gone. So they go up. And then your mature males, they hang out as long as they can followed by the lactating females. So these lactating females that have new calves, the ones who've just given birth this year, they want to hang out as long as they can to give their calf time to grow and get big because that migration is not easy. And so they need to give them as much time to get as big as they can. That is a good question and one I don't know that we have a full answer to. If the online audience can't hear the question, the question was how many calves can a female have in a lifetime? The calving interval, well, let's see, so they're sexually mature at five years, and after that, they typically don't give birth every year. Um, they give birth every two to three years, and then we don't have a ton of, there. I think there have been studies out there, and I'm not remembering all the results, um, to have the reset histories to know how frequently they, they will keep up that two or three year um, pattern, but we also have gaps because they might show up in Maui, they might show up in the Big Island. Um, so I'm not entirely certain. And I don't think we, I don't think we know. So I stopped doing intensive study on humpbacks about 10 years ago. And at that point, we didn't know if there was reproductive senescence and not in humpbacks, whether or not the females lived beyond reproductive capability. So not entirely sure. Yep. And so anyway, yep, so they're here and then they take them. So Mr. Two, does location matter? So here's our, our area in Hawaii. Most of the whales that are here, oops, I thought I had a title on that, are within the 100 meter isobath, sorry, not meter, 100 fathom isobath, which is that dotted line around all of the islands. And then there's that little area off Molokai, which is Penguin Bank, which is shallow. And so that's where most of the whales will be found. The most intensive study and the most whales in Hawaii are found here in the Ao Channel, a protected area between Maui, uh, Lanai, Koalabe, Molokai. And then there's also a lot of whales over the Kahala Coast in, in the Big Island. And so these are the protected areas. And this is a study done, we'll talk a lot more about this in a minute, called SPLASH. It was intensive data collection from 2004 to 2006. And these are the areas, so the areas in purple. So basically they had 203 individual IDs in Kauai, 89 off Oahu, 34 on Penguin Bank, 201 off Molokai, 1,526 individuals on Maui, and 507 individuals on the Big Island. So you'll see that most, most of the whales that are coming down here are off Maui, the caveat to this is most of the effort done is off of Maui. That's where most of the whale researchers are. Um, Big Island has the next concentration. So there's more whales, more researchers, but that always kind of confounds things a little bit when you, when you look at these studies. Um, the rest of this table is interesting because this shows basically, let's say we've got 201 individual whales found in Molokai. 61 of those were also seen in different, or at different times in Maui and 12 on the Big Island. So Maui has a lot of them, 99 also seen on the Big Island and versus Oahu. There's some on, you know, 89 in Oahu, 20 of those also seen on Maui. So that's kind of the gist of, they are moving a little bit between islands. They're not always, it's not just one exclusive island, the same, so each whale will kind of choose where to go. Um, are these 
these sightings that you have in that chart from the whale watch program or are these more the scientists' sightings? These are the scientist studies. So this was um, University of Hawaii, the sanctuary, the sanctuary boat off of Maui. Um, several um, other researchers in Maui. I'm going to forget all of their names. I know Dan Sullivan was out there. Debbie and Mark Ferrari were out there. Uh, Jim Darling was out there. Um, and we'll talk more about Splash in a minute because it, it's it involved four different re four hundred different researchers basically doing this. Yes. So you often see, read the statistic that ten thousand whales, uh, which are in Hawaii, are reported to be dead. Where's the rest of the whales on that chart? Well, we don't catch all of them. In, so these are basically individual photo IDs. So there's two things going on. One is being able to, you know, well, one, they have to fluke up. Then they have to fluke up in the right area in front of a boat so you can get a good enough picture and have to get a good enough picture. Um, and then, yeah, and those are the matches. So basically those things. You have to have the researchers out there. So this is not every single whale. This is all the whales that they were able to get a fluke photo from that was in good enough quality to match with other photos. So match with a previous, previous, previous years, that year. So this study basically, and this is really cool. We'll get, we'll, we'll really get into this, but it's, it's all like, um, all the researchers from all the feeding areas, um, Russia, Alaska, down the coast, and then all the breeding areas, Hawaii, Mexico, Japan compiled all their photos together. So that's the only thing this is representing. So that figure though, you've heard is right. Um, and then what this study basically did is after comparing all of those photos, they came up with a population estimate for the entire North Pacific, which was 20,000 whales. So that's, they're doing well. Um, and again, more on that in a minute. But here is stars matching. So one of those whales basically, uh, and we'll come back to this one, so two scar. So she was seen in 1984 in Maui and she was a mother, she had a calf. She was seen again in 1991 off the Big Island, but didn't have a calf with her. And again in 1995 off the Big Island, didn't have a calf with her. In 96, she was in Maui. She was a mother. She had a calf. In 98 with a calf. And then 2000 off Maui with no calf. So if you look at that pattern, what do you think? So basically, we had a re uh, researcher, she was actually in the same grad program I was, who found 34 females, and they had sightings from both Maui and the Big Island in different years. And she compared them, and she said, okay, well, when they were in Maui, did they have a calf or not? And those same females, when they were on the Big Island, did they have a calf or not? There were 50 sightings in Maui, and about, I think it was around 68 or 60 or 70 percent had calves, and then, sorry, from this angle, it's hard to see estimate me and 25 percent didn't and in the big island it was 39 sightings so just over 40 percent had a calf but a much higher percentage didn't so basically what we took away from this is that when females have a calf they're more typically going to be at, off of maui you've got you do have females that give birth off the big island but we kind of the researchers generally classify maui as the nursery and big island as the singles bar so you see a lot more juveniles a lot more single whales heading hanging out off the big island versus uh, maui So, a lot of mysteries are piling up. Researchers got together and created SPLASH, which is an acronym for the Structure of Populations, Levels of Abundance, and Status of Humpback Whales. Data collection was from 2004 through 2006, with analysis in 2007. Uh, the impetus for this study was the, the proposal to delist humpback whales from the endangered species list. And so we wanted to say, okay, well, if you're going to consider that, let's really take a look and find out how they're doing. So 50, or sorry, 50, yeah, 50 research groups, 400 researchers, 10 countries, 18,000 photos, 27,000 approaches of whales, um, found 8,000 unique individuals, which does not mean every individual existed, but that's who we had in our study, and 6,000 tissue samples. And so this, so the feeding grounds that were covered were California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alaska, um, up in the Aleutian Islands, where they were using, that was a, a NOAA ship, big white ship. Um, ocean-going vessels, smaller vessels usually by the coast in the Gulf of Alaska, Southeast Alaska, um, and really small boats off the coast of California and Washington. And then the breeding areas is Hawaii, mostly small boat effort, um, both Mexico, um, Japan, Philippines, and Hawaii. So the two primary purposes were to get fluke photos and get all those photo IDs, with digital camera or SLR camera, 
And then biopsy sampling. So we wanted skin and blubber tissues to look at the genetics, look at toxicity, look at a whole bunch of things um, using crossbows and stainless steel dart chips. And then we're, and I think almost, well, the goal was definitely to link the biopsy sample with the photo. Um, and I don't remember from the study how, I think every single one was linked or at least that was the goal. Sometimes a whale doesn't fluke up and you're out of luck. Yes. Are there any other parts that can be used for identification other than the fluke? Or is the fluke typically chosen because you get, can get better? The, for humpbacks, the only other thing that would really be a possibility is dorsal fins, and they do we do collect dorsal fin photographs, and you can match, but there's just it's it's a much smaller body part, and there's not any color patterning, and there's so much scarring, and even in, in competition they can change shape, so it's not it's good, and actually that's what we use when you're in a small boat tracking a group, and you're like, like we'd approach a group the whales would surface and we'd start naming them, like giving them temporary names based on their dorsal fin to figure out behavioral roles. Like who's, you know, who's the mother, who's the escort, who's the primary escort, who's, you know, secondary. Um, but then, yeah, but as far as for most studies, it's the, the fluke. So sometimes it takes a long time of following them to get the fluke out. Yeah. I'm glad you asked. So most, as long as you're from a small boat, Sorry, this isn't a really good photo, but that's the crossbow, and you see a little bit yellow bit right there? That's a float. So basically, you'd shoot the dart, it would hit the whale, it's got a stopper on it too. So basically, it would go and it would hit the whale and come back out, and it would just bounce, and in that part, it takes out a little plug of skin. It's about the size of a pencil eraser head. And then the dart would just sit, float in the water, and you just drive over and pick up the dart. Do they bleed? I'm trying to think if, I have, if I've ever seen blood on the whale. I'm sure they bleed a little bit. They bleed, there's so much blood on them from the competition with other animals that it, I think they might bleed a tiny bit, but it's their blubber layer compared to the thickness of the dart is so great that a lot of times they wouldn't, sometimes they react from their, they're disturbed by it and they might like whip their tail, but most of the time they chill out. And if you've got a mom who's used to being bumped by her calf, she won't even react. Because so they can't get um, any infections from that We've got, we've got, we, I mean, we, we're always concerned about that, but the, the recent histories that we have on biopsy darting has, there's never been any ill effect from taking a, a skin sample. It's basically, a whale is 45 tons, and so the equivalent of that is kind of like a needle prick for a human being, and so it's, and compared to the damage they inflict on each other, it's minor. <laughs> so. I guess that when we have a biopsy or, or an injection, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. the area is, um, Sterilized first. Yes. So they are, I mean, the darts are sterilized, but still in the ocean, well, I mean, and, but the whale can't be sterilized before it. But again, I think it's it's basically the size difference because when we get a biopsy, still it can be almost the same size as the one you're taking from a whale, but they're 40 feet long. And so, but to be concerned about it, you know, we've tracked them because there's also a lot of, actually, there's a lot more concern with the satellite tagging that we do which is actually a bit more invasive than taking a biopsy sample and they still following them along and there's there's very little evidence of ever a bad effect from the the darts that i have opinions on the length of dart that you should use in satellite tagging but those are my personal oh, <laughs> opinions what, what's that? i've seen big ones that are about six inches long basically and that whole thing gets put into the whale that one make that one makes me cringe yeah. but it's also a very effective research tool so but that's a personal, personally held opinion. But the ones that are smaller darts, about two inches long, it seems really long initially when you look at it and you think about it from a human scale, that's a little bit alarming. But watching what happens with these whales, they heal, like they've got, they do a lot of studies where they track the healing of whales that have had those tags and you can't even see the scar. So, but we're, we are, we are not doing those research methods without concern for the welfare of the animals. That's a good question. Oops. Let's see. My hard drive is very full. Okay. So moving on. So after all of that data collection, what did we learn? It's complicated, sort of. So same general trends exist where we've got the traditional breeding stocks with the Hawaii um, group migrating up to Alaska and then Mexico heading up towards the United States and Japan heading up to Russia. And I kind of liken it to, okay, what about me? I'm from Minnesota. 
So let's say, and I've got relatives up over in Boston and a cousin over in Boise. And winter comes. We're not staying in Minnesota. <laughs> you head to Bahamas. You had a lot of people are heading to Florida to go to Disney World. You had people heading to Cancun and Acapulco and Arizona. But then you've got my cousin over in Boise, and they're like, hey, most of the people from here go to Acapulco. Some go to Cancun. A couple go to Orlando, and then most of them go to Arizona. Versus what's happening over in Boston, most people going to the Bahamas. I actually have no idea what their actual stats on this are. And then some <laughs> going to Orlando and say some going to Acapulco. So if you take a look at then the you know the if you're trying to say, oh, we're, not, we're an alien, we want to figure out what the humans are doing, and you look at Cancun and say, oh gosh, well most of the you know the tourists here are from from Idaho and, and then there are some that are populated by Minnesota, but that's really different than what's going over in the Bahamas. And it's a mixture. So you've got a mixture of the, you know, if we were whales. A mixture of the animals that are coming, you know, Hawaii has animals that are coming from a whole bunch of different feeding areas. There's trends. There's a lot of them coming from Southeast Alaska and the Gulf of Alaska, but you know, there's a variety. And so they're all mixing here down in the breeding grounds. Same thing over in Mexico. You've got animals coming from a whole bunch of different regions all coming together. But if you look up at the Gulf, same thing, Gulf of Alaska, you've got whales that, you know, same ones winter in, in Mexico, but some of them winter in Hawaii. There is a lot of sight fidelity with humpback whales. So wherever they're born usually is where they go back to. So if they're a Maui whale or a Hawaii whale, they, a lot of them are going to, most of them are always going to come back to Hawaii and there's an extreme amount of site fidelity up in the feeding grounds or wherever their mom takes them to go feed, that's where they go year after year. So there's not much overlap there. But you do have a couple whales who one year they'll go to Hawaii and then at one point they were seen over in Mexico. So they got a little tired of the scenery and checked something else out. And other ones may be seen over in Japan. So there's a little bit of, of interchange like that, but not, not a lot. Here it is in numbers. So, um, and I think this is really cool. But oh okay, wait, we've got two. Okay, so this is just looking at what we were just talking about. So most of the whales. So if you follow the purple numbers down, these are the number of IDs. So the Philippines, there were seventy-seven unique IDs in the Philippines. Of those, five were found in Okinawa, five in Okaswara, one in Hawaii in different years. Um, let's say going on in Hawaii. So two thousand three hundred and seventeen whales um, identified. In Hawaii, of those 14, uh, were found also in Mexico at some point in time, two in Baja, uh, one in the mainland. And so little bits here and there, especially in Mexico, like 406 in Baja, and then 66 of those sometime in the mainland. So there's more um, changing of breeding areas that are happening down in Mexico um, because they're closer together, we assume. Um, whereas most, you know, 14 out of 2,317, or I guess, 17 out of 2,317 is not much. This will come, we'll talk about this when we talk about song too. This is the one I think is really cool. So this is the matches. So if we want to say, all right, who is here? So I'm talking, so I highlighted the Hawaii column. So in Hawaii, so these are all of the um, wintering grounds here and these are all the feeding grounds. So in Hawaii, if we look down this column, we can find out where everybody's from. So of these recites that have uh, another sighting up in a feeding ground, we can say 215 of the whales we have here are from Southeast Alaska, 150 are from the Gulf of Alaska, and then Northern BC is the next biggest number. So that's why we'll say, okay, most of the whales that we have here are coming from Alaska. And then you can look, the other trend is if you're looking at Philippines, Okinawa, and Ogasawara, some of these guys are coming from Russia and the Aleutians, but you don't see any of them coming from Northern BC or the US West Coast. If that makes sense, it's farther to swim. So the same pattern is here. So up here, you don't see any whales from Russia heading over to Mexico, um, or just a few of them from the Aleutians, but then you see a lot more interchange down there. So the question that came up, so of, from that chart, what percentage overall of the whales that we had, um, sorry, that's annoying. Um, what percentage of the whales overall had any resites in feeding grounds. So 26% of the population off the US West Coast were sited in some breeding ground somewhere. 26% of them off of um, basically southern BC had resites, 21% here, 19.5% there, 29% over in Russia, and only 15% in the Bering Sea. And so that was a question, why is that lower than the others? 
So this is kind of breaking that number down a little bit. So of that kind of grouping, if you look at, uh, they had 27 sightings in the Gulf of, I think you'd say Anadir, 50% uh, um, recite to a breeding area. Kamchatka Peninsula had 58 uh, IDs that had matches, and or I'm sorry, 50 IDs in total, and about 38% uh, of those had matches to a breeding area. Commander Islands had a really small sample size, only 17, but still 18% of those uh, were found uh, in a wintering area, and over here Bering Sea had a whole huge number of animals found in year 91, and about 16% of those were matched. The Aleutian Islands is only at 11%, and there were still 63 animals documented, and they didn't have a very high match rate. It was only actually about, if you compare it to the next smallest, uh, two-thirds, even less than the next smallest. So that led us to wonder, where are they going? And is there a secret new wintering area that we don't know about that wasn't used in this study? Like, where is this mythical place? So people oops, have been... Uh, trying to figure that out. Some new evidence came in. So the Philippines didn't have a very strong effort in splash. There wasn't, weren't a lot of people out taking photos. And so one of the studies came out and said, hey, actually, you know, now that we put some more effort in the Philippines, we're finding matches. So the Philippines is, is one, one particular place where we're seeing some of those whales go. Uh, Northwest Hawaiian Islands was, was, has been proposed as a breeding area that hasn't really been studied yet. Traditionally, we didn't think of having any whales there, but it's great habitat. There's actually more habitat that's the right kind, the shallow, calm waters, than are in the main Hawaiian Islands. And so researchers went out and put uh, acoustic recorders out there and have humpback whale song. It's happening exactly at the same time as the main Hawaiian Islands, because one of the uh, hypotheses would be, well, maybe they're just passing by on their way to the main Hawaiian Islands. But it's, then you find a different kind of a temporal trend. You'd hear song before and in, at the end of the season, but it's at the exact same time. Plus, if you remember back to those two whales who were tagged that had, headed directly north on that magnetic heading, they didn't pass anywhere near the Northwesterns. And so now we have um, some sightings out there, and it sounds like that there are a lot more whales up there than we realized. So we don't know how many, but that's another potential. And then... Brand new information. Um, our team from NOAA just came back from the Northern Marianas Islands a week and a half ago, um, specifically to study that area and say, well, hey, is this, we've, we've heard people talk about whales out here, but we don't know if this is a real area. Like, could, could there actually be humpbacks using this as a wintering area? And sure enough, off of Saipan, they have a whole bunch of uh, sightings of humpbacks, especially moms and calves. So, that will eventually be written up for publication, but that's, you're the first to hear it. So, taking us to mystery number four, and this stuff's really cool. So this is uh, the cultural transmission of humpback whale song, and this ties into migration for a couple of reasons. If you remember those whales that uh, were seen between Hawaii and Mexico, and then Hawaii and Japan. So there are a couple whales that are still going to different places. And humpback whale song is a very stereotyped song, and it's usually divided into themes, and it evolves throughout a season. And so if you're just thinking of one song, when I was in the field, it was just they were singing, Hawaii whales sang one song, and it had seven themes, and they would kind of evolve and change. And at the end of the season, it was a different song than at the beginning. And then they would stop, and they go up to Alaska, and they come back down. They pick up where they left off and keep, and keep singing, and the, the, the song would keep evolving. The whales in Mexico, one study found, was doing the exact kind, same evolution in following the same pattern. So we're not sure how that was happening and how they're hearing, you know, what's going on. A very even more dramatic uh, thing happened. This is in Australia. So this is a south southward migration on the east coast of Australia. So all the whales were singing the old type of song. So the old, old song is yellow. And then uh, in 1996, on the northward migration, one whale was singing this brand new purple song. And in the southward migration, same one whale singing the purple song. And then all of a sudden, on the northward migration in 1997, a whole bunch more whales. So 25, 30% of the whales were singing the new song. Some were singing an intermediate in between the two, and then the rest are still the old song. By 1997, on the southward migration, almost all the whales had changed over to this new song, and all of them in 1998. So where did the purple song come from? Turns out that's the same song from the west coast of Australia. And so one whale had come around and infiltrated and said, hey, this is my song, you should all sing it. And so they're like, cool, all right. And they all just, you know, 
just started singing this new song. And this, I mean, this was it just made this guy's career. It was a great you know, <laughs> discovery. <laughs> so then we're like, well, gosh, we should find out what's happening in the rest of the ocean. And so this is a study. This was really cool. This was um, published in 2001 of the entire South Pacific Ocean Basin. And so the colors represent different types of songs, not just these, but the actual whole song. So here we've got the, the black song, for East Australia, New Caledonia, and Tonga. And then this is the hash lines or no data. So we don't know what's happening there. And then the Cook Islands and French Polynesia had a different type of song altogether. Well, then eventually in 2000, East Australia started singing a new song. And by 2001, it had spread over to Tonga. We're not sure what's happening over there. And then that these two actually aren't entirely different. This is kind of an evolution of this song. Um, so that's a new song. And then that one spread all the way over to French Polynesia. Then they picked up a new song. So I don't know if they're all starting in West Australia and coming over, but that's there, there's some kind of cultural transmission happening. And it, it's, it's aided by these whales who don't always stick to the plan of going back to the same reading ground. So here are these exceptions whales that do the darndest things. So we had a whale, not we, but there was a whale in Brazil um, in 1999 who showed up on the east coast of Madagascar in 2001. Not your typical place for it to be. And so that distance was a minimum of 9,800 kilometers, which was a record at that point in time. And that was a female. And then there's another whale who was also seen in Madagascar, um, same area, and was found in Gabon um, in 2002. This was a juvenile male. So to put those in perspective, so here's the map. So this is the one from Brazil, and she ended up over here. And here's this juvenile male who was in Madagascar, and he ended up over there. So don't always stick to the plan. And then there was another whale who, um, as, a, as a migratory path, basically went from Antarctica near Area 1, uh, showed up in American Samoa in 2005, then back down in Area 1 in 2009, which is an 18,840-kilometer kil round trip. And that's the longest actual migratory trip that we've seen. So that is, yeah, all the way from here down, or seen here first and up there and then back again. I guess I don't have to keep coming back here. Um, then we have one last exception. There is a population of whales in the Arabian Sea that does not migrate. They're the only population that doesn't. They're considered endangered. Um, I don't actually remember what the number of the population is, but when they did the genetic study on it, they estimated that it's been isolated for 70,000 years. So there's no photo ID matches with other populations anywhere close or anywhere at all. Um, and there's no genetic, I can't think of the word trade between different populations basically. So they're, they're completely isolated. So that's a really fascinating thing. You're kind of like, all right, what's going on? So that brings us to our last mystery, which is climate change. And so given what we've all talked about, I'm curious what you guys think. What would, how would climate change impact the humpback whale migration? Stay north longer. They could stay north longer. Anything else? That's the main one for us. So basically, when you have whales that are... Um, migrating when they're down in their wintering areas they basically need a quiet area a protected area so unless the killer whales infiltrate there's probably not a lot i don't i think they, they can withstand the waters off maui fairly well um you'll note that they're one of the only species of really big whale that you'll see in shallow waters and their peck fins are vascularized and so it helps them actually manage the heat now i don't know what the limits are on that but there's going to be less pressure on them to change their wintering areas unless they start having a higher amount of predation um, however, the feeding grounds, the animals follow their prey. Where can they get food? That's the number one source. And so there's a couple of things. So we don't really know, but we assume that that's what's going to happen. We know that like the gray whales are traveling further north right now because of the sea ice melt and their prey is changing. Um, if you guys heard about the humpbacks that were seen really close to shore this past year in California and Monterey, so I guess the upwelling patterns have changed. The wind patterns have changed. So the, up, the area of water, the upwelling where the food is coming up to the surface that used to be this center, I think California is here. And so the upwelling was a bigger area along the coast. It shrank and got a lot further close to the coast. And so the whales in order to feed just had to become closer to coast, closer to the coast. So you saw a lot of really cool pictures of kayaks and whales. No comment on that. Um, and then Antarctica, the same thing is happening. We think with the krill populations, um, and I don't, I, 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 can't speak a lot to this, but I know that they're they're finding 
the, a lot of the krill are inside the bays where they used to think they were more further off the coast. And so now the, the researchers are like, okay, well, let's go check out these bays. And they're finding a lot more whales closer in to, um, to the coast than they, they'd found before. So things are already beginning to shift. And so basically it's just going to depend on, on where the food goes. But as evidenced by some of these whales we've talked about, they are capable of swimming very long distances. So hopefully they'll be okay for a while as long as there's enough food. And that's all I have. Any questions? The females who have who give birth and are nursing while they're down here, um, I think they lose up a third of their body weight. But when I've been out in April, basically going tracking whales, sometimes you can even almost begin to see you see their um, their spinal ridge a lot more. Like they're much, they're you know kind of big tubes at the beginning of the season. By the end, you're like, oh, you're you have a dorsal spine. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, they, I, I don't know if that, that answers your question or. Well, considering that the lactate feeding young. Well, I think that that's probably one of the reasons that they don't. So there are very few females have given birth in consecutive years, but it's not common. And so the general thought is it's just too much, it's too taxing on her system to be able to actually sustain that, to nurse a cow, get back up north, and all of a sudden start um, producing the fetus and bringing it back. So that, I think, might be one of the reasons for the at least two-year gap in the cow. Why make the trip? <laughs> that's the question. I mean, we don't... Other than being like, well, it's a protected area and it's a good place you can kill a whale. That's really all we've got. So it's, I'm not entirely certain, and some don't. There are there are whales that have been seen to, to overwinter. Yeah. Is there anything like that triggers the migration, like day length or water temperature or salinity or I don't know? Is there, what is it that, that okay. I mean, if there's still food there, you know, there's still going to be food where they're yeah, so what, what is it? Yeah, I I don't know. There might be something out in the literature on that. Um, Ten years ago, there wasn't. Um, I think some people, I'm trying to think of if people, because the whales who sing, some of them will even start to sing on the feeding grounds. And so there was a hypothesis put forward that that was a trigger for estrus for females. But I, I don't remember if that was... If people thought that that could have been also a trigger for hey, this is a change in migration, but then it'd be the same question, just push back. Why did they start to say yeah. So yeah, there's got to be some kind of environmental cue. I could have some guess, but that's all I would do. Sort of a personal question: How did you get into whale research coming from the Midwest? Of the <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I, when I have answered before, so I was really into animal behavior in general, and I had been studying tigers actually at the Minnesota Zoo and went to science fair. Ended up at the science camp in West Virginia and met folks that were marine biologists and I said, I want to check out marine biology. And they said, come do this internship at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So I did that. I was actually supposed to study mussels. And <laughs> I was looking for a biological oceanographer and I, we were going out to sea for two weeks and studying internal waves on this um, uh, Seamount, and we were going to drop this machine that had a muscle on it, and then it had a little sensor, and it was going to measure how, how well it grew at every internal weight. I got out there, and it broke. So my advisor looks at me, and he's like, well, you look like animals. Why don't you watch the whales? <laughs> and so I did a feeding study of how the baby whales and how their, their occurrence was going along or correlated to the passing of these internal waves. became my master's thesis, or my, my, sorry, my BA thesis um, at the University of Minnesota, and Took that and applied to graduate school. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a long answer. But that's how I'm <laughs> Thank you guys, you're a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.